Last week we began our, our Ephesians study. We talked about how we've received all we have in Christ. Um, how it's not individual. He gave all of himself to all of the church. And if we receive him, then, then we receive all he has. Um, Paul wanted the church in Ephesus to understand the surpassing greatness of Jesus. He wanted them to understand how God has blessed them with everything every spiritual blessing in Christ uh, and how that blows everything else out of the water. Now, uh, as we said last week, that offended some people of the day who like to proclaim the greatness of Artemis. It also offended people who like to <laughs> proclaim the greatness of their own wealth. Um, and, uh, and Paul says, no matter, no matter what you're living for, whether it's Artemis, whether it's uh, 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 power, whether it's sexual experience, whatever it is, Jesus is better. And so in chapter 2, he, uh, he spells it out for us a little more. He tells us exactly what Jesus has done for them and therefore for us, because we're reading this right along with the, uh, the Ephesians. So let's dive in here. Um, the first thing he's going to do here is talk about being saved from things we've done, which lead to death, and all that springs out of our desires. So let's, let's read this first bit. You were dead in your transgression, or excuse me, trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Let's pause here. This is interesting because today in the West, we consider it almost a sin to go against our own desires. Our, our, our chief aim is to be true to ourselves. And that's kind of the big mantra, right? You do you. How do you get fully alive? By following your desires. This is what we do in modern America. So here's what Paul is saying. It, it should, if, if this feels, if you feel like, ooh, this is, yeah, that's different. Well, it is different because what he's telling you is that your desires, your passions can lead to death. That's kind of unfortunate. <laughs> I thought me being me was supposed to do something Amazing. Well, not necessarily. Now, I've talked about this. We've talked about this many times in terms of identity and, and these things. And, and guess what? We're going to keep talking about this. And here's the reason. I think in those, in those remember Paul taught in the school of Tyrannus for, for two years? I think he probably talked a lot about the, the, the temple of Artemis and the worship that went on there. I'm, I'm sure he did. I'm sure he talked about those different things that the culture was bringing. We don't worship at the temple of Artemis in America. We worship at the temple of self, okay? So therefore, we're gonna continue to talk about this kind of thing. So you've heard us say it, I'm gonna say it again. Here's the thing, our primary message that we get through entertainment, through media, all of these things is this, summed up in this Sprite ad campaign, obey your thirst. <laughs> Obey your thirst. To gain a sense of identity, we look inside. It was a great ad campaign because they were tapping into this very cultural thing, right? We look inside. You want to know who you really are. You, wanna, you want real purpose and destiny. You look deep inside and you find out what is my thirst. And you go after that thing. Sprite is assuming that all of your thirst deep down is for their soft drink, which may or may not be the case. But uh, that, that is so, it's so culturally relevant and it works so well. Now, of course, they didn't start that. This is, there's been many things throughout the history of our country that have, have led to that and encouraged that. I think of, you know, one of the great songs of the 20th century is Frank Sinatra's My Way, right? Which is a fantastic song. It's this rousing, beautiful, like, oh, you feel the stirring. It's, you know, he reaches this climax of, oh, I did it my way. You know, and you're like, yeah, yeah. And it's, it, you feel it, you get caught in it. And it's, it's more than just like this awesome sounding song for some. It becomes a, wow, what a really good man. What a noble man. He did it his way. And somehow it goes from being like this, it, you know, just a, good sounding song to like this cultural deep-seated truth. If only we could all be like Sinatra and do it our way. 
Yeah, and actually that's not a real good thing to do. Frank had some issues, right? <laughs> anyway, in other words, you want identity, you want purpose, find your thirst. Find you, do that thing, do it your way, and that's nobility. In fact, you're almost betraying right and wrong if you march to the beat of somebody else's drum. It's almost like, dude, that's so wrong. You're not being true to yourself. Now, <clears throat> we see this in every Disney movie ever made, ever made, of course. This is, and I'm not even knocking Disney. I really not. Like, this is some great stories. But this pretty much is what you see in all of these. You have a character stuck in a culture that makes demands of that character, right? The demands she doesn't want to live by. So she finds liberation ultimately by being herself, right? Self-expression leads to, to freedom. Now, don't get me wrong. There are aspects of that that are absolutely true and need, that, that's a story that needs to be told because in many places, people really are repressed, oppressed, they, they, and, 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 and told, you know, forced to live in the, the situations that are very wrong, etc. So that is a, it's a valid story in many cases, but I think the story's been done to death and we keep getting hit over the head by the story over and over again to where we really think, man, the answer to everything is to be yourself, to follow your passions. I mean, it worked for Ariel. Now, <laughs> Paul here says, our desires, when run amok, lead to sin and death. That's the spirit of the age he's talking about. He's saying, you follow your lusts, and it actually leads to bondage, not freedom. It leads to death. And isn't that ironic? Because following our desires was supposed to make us feel alive. Having desires, by the way, isn't in itself the problem. The problem is when we let them rule us because all of us already have desires anyway, right? Some of them we're born with. Some of them are, you know, we, we are sort of pressed into us. The power of suggestion is a really powerful thing today. Um, so we have nature and nurture. We have things we want, good things. You, most of them deep down are good things that we end up fulfilling them in bad ways or in ways that are, are too much. Um, so in America, when we... we uh, um, we put our desires over everything else. We call that liberation. Desires over everything else is liberation. But what Paul and what the scriptures tell us, that's not liberation, that's actually idolatry. Do you get that? We say, this is what makes you free. This is the ultimate purpose. That's liberation. Follow your desires. And Paul is saying, yeah, that, you, you just, that's, that's idol worship. You have made an idol out of those deep things that you want. And that's what he's addressing here. Now, the Apostle John talks about these desires and he breaks them down into three different categories in the book of 1 John. He mentions the lust of the eyes. Um, this is the lust to get things, to, to own lots of possessions. This is very relevant in a place where you can get anything you want all the time. And isn't it interesting that our view in the West of heaven is where we just have this massive mansion and we get whatever we want. It's like you know, living in a Sears catalog or something. I mean, that's like, that's almost what it is. It's like, that just totally appeals. Oh, that'd be amazing. I could get, uh, that espresso machine's amazing. Speaking of, I mean, that's All these guys are like, no, really, what is the Sears catalog? Stuff? <laughs> Maybe live in Amazon on Prime Day. How about that? There we go. I can get this random watch that tells me my body mass index. I'm not even sure what it means, but it's on Prime Day. So here we go. <laughs> wow. I actually lost my train of thought over that. Thank you very much. <laughs> the lust of the eye is the wanting of stuff, the material uh, eye. Another one is the lust uh, of the flesh. This is the, the desire for experience, especially sexual experience, but not at all limited to that. Um, I would add a chemical experience to this, drugs and alcohol. I would add the constant dopamine hits that we get from scrolling on social media. I would, <laughs> I would add the watching YouTube videos for hours and hours on end, right? That desire to feel good, 
to, to feel something, to have an experience. That's the, that's the lust of the flesh. Now, again, we all have the desire for experience. I'm not saying anytime you watch a YouTube video, then suddenly you're idolatrous. That's not what I'm saying. But when, that, when those things become your prime motivator, that's idolatry. And that's what he's saying. Okay, the other is the boastful pride of life. Uh, the pride of life can be a preoccupation with your own power, your own standing. Could be an obsession with how other people perceive you. Could be with your own popularity, your own personal advancement, your own image. Because image is power. Interestingly enough, these three appetites were, were actually sort of deified for real in the ancient world. There were three gods that were talked about over and over again in the Old Testament, and they correspond to these three desires. The first one is Baal. You see Baal everywhere. Baal, you, people worshipped Baal in order to get a good harvest. Okay, another one was Ashtaroth. People worshipped Ashtaroth, this goddess, for the same reason the Ephesians worshipped Artemis. She was essentially the same goddess, just passed on from one culture to the next, as often happened with ancient mythology. Um, she, she was a, a hypersexualized character, like we said last week, served by male and female prostitutes. People worshipped Ashtaroth because of, uh, uh, of that practice. So you can see how that ties in exactly right with the lust of the, the flesh and the boastful pride of life. There was this other god called Moloch, and you worshipped Moloch for power. Whole, whole countries would worship Moloch for power. And part of the way they did that actually was by human sacrifice sometimes. So you'd have, if a country lost a battle, there, there's records of countries losing a battle and having this mass, mass uh, uh, worship service where, where there would be massive human sacrifices to Moloch so that they could regain power. So you see how these things are taught, these themes hit again and again in, in, in Scripture in different ways. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. These are desires that, that might start innocent, but they expand and they go out of control, and ultimately they lead to death, as does every form of idolatry. Are you guys with me? Okay. So... In America, of course, we don't have these idols because we can have whatever we want, but we have those appetites, and by and large, they rule our country. So we need salvation. We, as human beings, need salvation, but we can't do, our, do it ourselves. You know why, according to this passage? Because we're dead. <laughs> you, you can't save yourself if you're dead in your sins, right? Follow that metaphor. We're dead in our transgressions. Oh, this is a problem. This is a problem, okay? So, we were separated by death, all of us, and we needed to be saved. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Did you, did you get that? Because nobody responded whatsoever. <laughs> we were, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. That's, I mean, I think that's good news. I don't know, whatever. Maybe you guys don't, but. And raised us up with him. Seated us with him in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Jesus comes and he, he makes us alive. He wakes us up. He cuts the bonds of slavery to ourselves and he grants us kindness by grace. We don't have to be led away by those passions anymore. You guys, Jesus doesn't just save us from hell. He saves us from ourselves. It's not because you were brave either. It's not because any of us were like, man, I'm so glad I got myself out of there. <laughs> no, you couldn't. It's strictly by his grace that we've been saved. That's it. Our salvation could only come from the outside. It's not our own doing. I heard one person say, he was like, yes, I searched and found, the evangelist was giving this example of like, yes, I searched and found Jesus. He goes, that's not what happened. What really happened is that you were running away from him and he was chasing after you and he jumps and he tackles you like that organ player and the fan who ran out on the field yesterday. He tackles him from the back, smothers him, turns him open and pries his eye open and he goes, oh, Jesus, I found you. <laughs> that's more like what we're talking about. 
Y'all need Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need Jesus. I never give those kinds of instructions. It's usually Joshua's thing, but I just wanted, I just like that. No, sorry. You need Jesus, so do I. It might sound like bad news, judgmental news, but consider this. I love what Tim Keller said. Here's what Tim Keller said. He says, this is the most progressive egalitarian truth ever. We are all completely level at the foot of the cross. Every single one of us is totally sinful and is broken and in need of a savior. How about that? It's not just you, it's me too. Hey, we're all in the same boat. We all need Jesus. So don't worry. You're like, are you saying I'm broken? Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry, so am I. You see? So let's all be offended at that together and then turn to Jesus and say, hey, save me from being offended too easily. All right. <laughs> we move forward. So he uses the metaphor of death, right? Okay, but he doesn't stop there. Paul doesn't stop there. He gives us another picture. Another picture. This one isn't about sin. This, it's not about what we do, actually, but this is about circumstances. Uh, he talks about being separated by country, by ethnicity, this kind of thing, okay? Here we go. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made by flesh, uh, in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of two. So making peace and, and might reconcile us both to God and one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. This is really uh, a good news. In the New Testament, sometimes I think we don't realize what a big deal racial tension was in the New Testament. It was a massive deal. Um, it, much of uh, uh, the book of Galatians is focused on that. Uh, uh, Romans talks a lot about it. And, and there's a big chunk of Acts where this is a big controversy. Um, because God, of course, had given the revelation of himself to the, the, the Hebrew people throughout the Old Testament. And Jesus comes in that country, in that nation, and he offers himself up for salvation. And then what happens is that people are like, well, Christianity is just Judaism plus, plus Jesus. So you have to become a Jew in order to get there. And then Paul starts, Paul and Peter start like preaching to people who aren't Jews and the Holy Spirit falls. And they go, uh-oh, this is for everybody. This is different than we thought. And then people don't like that they think it's for everybody. They say, no, this is, this is just for us. And they say, no, it's not. So you have this, this real, very tense situation. So here's Paul talking to people who aren't Jews. These are, these are cosmopolitan people in Ephesus. So they're, they're Greeks, they're Romans, they're like coming from all over the place. And he says, you know, you used to be separated from the blessings. And that wasn't even your fault but you have been brought in now. There is no more separation. There is no more dividing line. You are now part of the family. And you can't just make yourself a part of the family. That doesn't work. You've been brought in. You've been invited. Because Jesus died not only for Jews, but for Gentiles as well, for Ephesians. Jesus died for Ephesians. The wall's been broken down. Now he drives the point home here. You ready for this? He came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to one spirit. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You were separate and it wasn't even your fault. You had no inheritance because you weren't part of the family. The only way you could be saved and included was if someone adopted you into the family and that's exactly what Jesus has done. Do you see what this speaks to? This speaks 
The first half of the chapter is speaking to the things that we have done and think that we're disqualified. The second half is things that, that have been done to us and we might feel disqualified. And Paul says, no, Jesus died for you. Yes, even you. This family is for you. Yes, even you. You might feel that because of some of these things that, that there's not a place at the table for you, but there actually is. There actually is. I got to tell you about Mephibosheth. We almost named all, all five of our kids Mephibosheth. <laughs> so close. Emily, we never told you that. We're still thinking about it. You're not 18 yet. You can make that switch. <laughs> Here's the story. I love this story. David and Saul, you know about the tension that they had early on. Man, David was this loyal, loyal soldier for King Saul, but Saul didn't seem to be very grateful about it. And he, he well, he tried to come and murder him over and over again. That's not the gratitude. So David spent years of his life, even though he was loyal to the king and loyal to the country, he spent years of his life running away from this madman king. And, uh, and so we know about that and we read a lot about that, but there's something that happened one day when uh, the, the Israelites, King Saul and Jonathan, his son, happened to be David's best friend, they're fighting against the Philistines. And in the same day, both of them are killed. Philistines rout them and both of them are killed. And in, in the fallout, word immediately starts getting out because the Philistines are parading his armor, Saul's armor around and everything, and the king is dead, yay! Now, in the ancient world, when the king dies, there's huge ripple effects and, and, and terrible things happen. If you read Kings and Chronicles, you see this happen over and over again. And the first thing that happens very often is you'll have a challenger to the throne who wants to purge the line of the king that just died. So there's panic. People don't know what's going to happen. And so the house of Saul you know, go, goes into a bit of chaos. Uh, um, Saul's, Saul's uh, another one of his sons, um, decides that he wants to challenge David to the throne. So that's happening. He's trying to raise up all these men. That's a very short-lived situation. That was, a, that was a bad move. Didn't he know who David was at this point? I don't understand that. Anyway, he, he, tried to, he tried to do that, even though David had been anointed and Jonathan himself was going to pass the kingship over to him. Yeah, all of this, like, uh, uh, there, there's chaos, right? And, and, and we don't know what happens to any of the other family except for this one kid. Okay? He was five years old. He was Saul's grandson, Jonathan's son. Five years old. And his nurse gets word that, Saul, that the king is dead, that the boy's grandfather is dead. And she says, oh no, we have to run. We have to run. Whether she was afraid of David or afraid of the Philistines, we don't even know. But the chaos that ensued was so expected that she picks up the boy and they start running. Well, he falls and he breaks his legs somehow. We, or we don't know what happens, but he falls and gets a, an injury so serious that he's crippled for the rest of his life. So he might have fallen on his head and maybe, uh, you know, had some spinal cord injury. Um, he might have just broken his legs so badly and, you know, they didn't know how to reset the bones all the time. And maybe that was the reason. We don't know what happened, but he was crippled. And she takes then this crippled, screaming child and hides him for years. I go into hiding. And David, in the meantime, he consolidates his throne and then he, you know, he becomes king and he has years of success and all of this is going on. But in 2 Samuel 9, please don't bother turning there, but in, it, he, he, he says one day, I don't know what led to this, but he asks this question. He says, uh, is there still anyone left from the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And he asks this question. They say, that's a really good question. Nobody here knows. But there was this guy, Ziba, it's another great name, by the way. There's some expectant parents in here. Zeba. I think it could work for a boy or a girl, actually. That's good. They say, find Zeba, because Zeba worked in the house of Saul for years, and he's over his estates. He's like a property manager or something, you know? So they find him, and they bring him in. And David asks this question, hey, Zeba, Zebo, gazebo. I don't know, I probably played with that. Zeba, are there any left in Saul's line that I can show kindness to? And I don't know if, I have a theory that maybe Ziba knew David because he was over at his house all the time, right? With Jonathan, they're playing Xbox late into the night and all that. So he probably knew him. And, uh, or maybe he was just scared being in the king's house. If I'm Ziba, I'd be terrified if I didn't know 
that David was being kind here. I, I'm not going to give him the address of the one living heir, but he does. He said, yeah, his name's Mephibosheth. Did I say Mephibosheth? <laughs> and David says, where is he? And he, he, gives him, he gives him the address. And so they send for Mephibosheth. <laughs> They send for him, and they pick him up. Now, I want you to imagine this. You're, you're a young man, and you know your own story of your grandfather and how he tried to kill the current king for years. You know the story of your uncle who tried to challenge the king for the throne. You know all of these things. And here, finally, is the knock at the door that you've been dreading your whole life. It's the king's men coming for you, and you can't run. So they take him to the king. They put him on a horse and they haul him in. What do you think he was, what do you think he's feeling? Huh. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and he fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, do not fear. For I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father. And you shall eat at my table always. And Mephibosheth paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? What's he dealing with? A whole lot of fear. David picked up on that right away. A whole lot of fear. A whole lot of shame. He's got a history. He has an ugly heritage. A whole lot of embarrassment, maybe about his, his condition. Crippled people didn't, you know, weren't elevated back then. Still aren't today, but it was really a hard thing back then, especially. So here he is in this pitiful shape and he doesn't quite believe it. He, I'm, well, I'm just a dead dog. Why, why would you turn your eye to me, David? Worship team, can you guys come? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and he said to him, all that belonged to Saul and all of his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him, shall bring him in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's own sons. He had lots working against him. He had a lot that was out of his control, beyond his control. He was alienated and his loyalties, who knows, might have even still been divided. Later chapters indicate that. But David invites him in and he adopts him. And like one of his own sons, they eat together. And all he had to do, you guys, was come. All he had to do was lay aside whatever allegiance he might have had and embrace the king's unbelievably generous offer. And that is the picture of Ephesians 2. It's what Jesus did for us. You see, we've been separated by both our desires, the things that we have done, the ways we have given those over and followed through in sin. We've been separated by those and we've been separated by things that we've been given in terrible circumstances and, and fear and abuse and different kinds of oppression. All of these things and it doesn't matter what those are. Jesus says, yes, even you, I have a place for you at my table. It doesn't matter the fear. It doesn't matter the shame, all of these things. It doesn't matter what you're bringing. He says, yes, even you. But I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Yes, even you. Yeah, but my sins aren't just like I gossip sometimes or sometimes I say bad things about my dad. Like my sins are serious. It's like, yes, even you, all our sins are serious, even you, even you. Just like Mephibosheth, we can come. 
And this is why Paul is so adamant. By grace, you have been saved. By grace, you have been saved. And it doesn't matter what those things are that you've dealt with. Because it's not like you had it, you were so good you had it, and then you lost it, sorry. That's not what it is. It's by his grace. That's the only reason you're saved in the first place. You never, you never warranted by your good works enough to, to earn a place with him. It's only by grace, and he has grace even for you. Mephibosheth, even for you.